Captain America to the rescue again for Norwich City. A 1-0 win against Sunderland. Their playoff march continues. Carrow Road form extending to 10 championship games unbeaten. Five of those, uh, the last five, have all been victories. It's, um, it's quite something what they're doing at the moment at Fortress Carrow Road. Welcome to this week's edition of the Pinkin.com Norwich City podcast brought to you uh, in association with our sponsors. If you can guess who that is, if you're watching, Coleman's of Norwich, of course, producers of the finest mustard and other condiments in all the land. A uh, full roster of Pinkin um, mainstays uh, uh, this, this week. No Cedric Consolan. We've, we've lost the exuberant French accent. We've got a Cov Midlands one instead, I'm afraid. I'm Connor Southwell, joined by Samuel Seaman, Paddy Davitt, and Adam Harvey. Paddy, it's um, welcome back, first and foremost. I say that like it was uh, a grand absence. It was only, it was only Blackburn away. Um, another good afternoon, very different type of win. If we, if we reflect on the two wins, uh, actually, no, actually, first thing, this is the first point I need to, need to clear up. Kenny McLean, what, what was it that he wasn't able to do on, on Friday, just to clear up? Because I think there was a little issue with the, the tweet that you put out um, when you meant to put walk, I think, but um, there was a semicolon in place of the L and I think there was some, some thoughtful minds. So just, it was definitely walk he wasn't able to do. Yeah, you've lost me now, mate. I'm, I, I, have, you not, have you not looked nah, at your name? Nah. Uh, there's, yeah, clearly, there's been some uh, error with the key. Uh, <laughs> Well, if, I think I did say stiffness, stiffness to his back, so that's pretty obvious. But yeah. uh, uh, no doubt that's been picked up on X, so uh, they can do one. But uh, <laughs> yeah, stiff. I, I'm struggling with. I'm struggling myself, to be fair. I've got a bit of a flu, so um, don't try and banter me today, Connor, because it's uh, probably not going to end too well. But uh, yeah, no, I digress. Uh, no, he definitely. Well, so David tells us, uh, Braveheart himself uh, woke up Thursday morning with a stiff back and. Uh, Sounds like he was even this morning. Uh, really had to go into the recovery centre at Colney, uh, that new recovery pool, which looks to have done done the trick. Uh, Chris Burton, is it the yeah. physio? Yeah, the David was very keen to to give him a reference and uh, and all the work that they've done to get Kenny on the pitch. And um, yeah, I mean the, the payoff for me was, and he said this a few times recently, David, that uh, you know match day minus one uh, in his career as a manager, he wouldn't even consider playing a player who couldn't make the final train session. In fact, it was Sargent, wasn't it, a few few weeks back, actually, um, who had to prove his fitness. But he said it, there's one exception, and that is Kenny McLean. And uh, thankfully, the mayor was fit and available. Uh, well, available. Uh, and it just typifies maybe what's in that group and, uh, you know, him more more so than, than others. We, you know, we spoke to him at Colney the week before and... Uh, that was a healthy debate as well about uh, top threes and where he would rank in the in the current top three uh, for player of the season. But you cannot dispute that he is very clearly uh, among the best players, characters that Norwich have got in that group. Has proven it this season, and he's proven it again in a slightly different way today by not not giving in and uh, not taking you know not taking the route that to go and sit in the stand and um, you know declaring himself fit and. Uh, and they probably needed him as well. Uh, obviously, now we know that that was the case. You know, there was you know certain parts of his game, maybe in Zara as well. In that first half, you, you felt they could maybe have stepped on it a little bit more. And we'll get into that in due course. But you know, you cannot deny that that, that guy is um, he's pivotal to where they are now at this point of the season. But more importantly, from here, what they go on to hopefully achieve, which is to get into the top six and then take it from there. You know, without him in the mix. Um, I think they'd definitely fall short. So uh yeah, it's a testament to that man. Um but I'm not I'm not overly surprised and I doubt there's too many Norwich fans that, you know, he would have done everything in his powers physically to combat a, st uh, a stiff back and um and the fact that he did is a testament to him uh, and the people around him as well and uh you know, as David said, you know, he didn't it was he, he didn't really it was off the back of a Josh Sargent question really and he didn't want to necessarily take away from the team performance but he clearly felt you know that he had gone above and beyond the mayor so fair play to him tonight but definitely back yes def definitely definitely a back and definitely walking I think that he was doing as opposed to anything else um, yeah and he's, he's played every single minute of this championship season for Norwich City and, and it's a very elite club mostly of goalkeepers I think Ethan Ampadu at, at Leeds Matt Grimes at Swansea there's a couple of others as well but a very elite club of players to have played all Every single minute of every single game so far in the championship is incredible. What he's, what he's done. Um, 
Adam, before we delve into the game, nice nice week away for you. I think whilst we were in Blackburn, you were watching Harrogate Town, is that right, in, in, in League Two? There was a bit of uh, Norwich interest there, so tell us a little bit about Emmanuel Adeboyega. Yeah, so I had a, a little trip up to York to see my sister's up there for university, so I haven't seen her. Well, she's back over Christmas, but very brief occurrences in terms of me being working and her out doing things. So, uh, yeah, it was good to spend a bit of time and then come to the Saturday and she's like, you know... Um, We'll do the sort of touristy sites on Sunday. So what do you want to do on Saturday? Me being me, first thing I do is look at all the football fixtures in the area. Um, York, unfortunately, were away. So uh, Harrogate's sort of only a 30-minute train away from York. So um, very nice town. So we had a little wander around there on the, on the morning. And then obviously, yeah, you mentioned the Norwich interest. Um, that was kind of what I sort of, for me, picked that game out. Um, Adebayega. Started that game um, until today. That was the only game he hadn't scored a, a goal in, um, unfortunately, which is probably my luck. But uh, yeah, he was very solid um, against a, a physically quite big Harrogate side, um, and he sort of matched them. Um, bit, there was a few times where he brought the ball out really nice, um, some nice switches of play, and looked, you know, probably a, almost a class above that level, which is probably, you know, for him maybe next season if he's not in and around the first team pitcher at Norwich, it's probably a case of looking in at League One sides and trying to make that next step. Um, so, yeah, positive from him um, and a good weekend away, of course, probably a a better performance for, for him than maybe you guys got to see at Ewood Park. But, of course, Norwich have uh, resurrected that today and, and got the huge three points they needed. Yes, uh, let's let's not dwell any more on that. <laughs> that you would part your thing did quite enough of that uh, last weekend, Sam. It's um, a very different type of win today. Uh, you know, we saw it. Carrie was saying to to Paddy before. I very need to go from that point of order to to clarify his tweet. Mm -hmm. um, it it was a different type of win. If if you think about the Watford game, which was uh, chaotic in itself and overshadowed in the end, but that Cardiff win as well, eight goals in two games. Norwich needed a different side today, didn't they, to get themselves over the line. And it's um it's always a good thing, I think, to see that a team, particularly in the run that Norwich City have, have that type of win in them, I think. Yeah, it's kind of a, a weird position to be in because usually when we talk about things in, in these sorts of terms, it's when Norwich have been maybe the worst side and still come out with, with the victory, but I felt that they were probably the, the better team um, throughout the game. It just wasn't an especially high-quality high, high quality game. I thought the conditions um, played a bit of a part. You could really see the injuries and the impact that they had. Um, I think, in fact, today's fixture, more than anything, helped highlight the, the sorts of roles that Arnel Hernandez and, and Marcelino Nunez can play in that team um, because... Yeah, tactically it felt like more of a, a difficult a difficult one to get out of the way. It felt like more of a problem for Norwich to solve. They really struggled to provide as much of a threat in, in wide areas as they have in, in recent games. So, um, yeah, they definitely had to grind it out more than maybe they have in, in a lot of their recent home games. But um, when I was speaking to, to fans after the game, there did seem to be this acceptance that you can probably forgive them that, especially in the context of the performances at Carrow Road because of how good they've been, how how fluid the attacking has been at times. And you mentioned that Watford game, the Cardiff game, obviously eight goals in two. I think, in fact, as much as um, it might be frustrating not to see as much entertainment uh, as there was in those two games, it was both forgivable because of that context and also probably in some ways refreshing to see that Norwich actually still can do that. Obviously, there was a period in the season where most of their wins were coming from defensive solidity and uh, maybe not the most entertaining games. Uh, the one against QPR really comes to mind when I talk about that. But um, yeah, as long as they follow this up with more fluid performances that get back towards where they were before this game, I think it, it looks like a very, very good win and a vital three points um, when obviously they're, they're chasing down the top six. They've now cut that gap to, to just one point, so you can see how big it is. Um, but, you know, as I was just getting at, really, that needs to be a game and a performance in isolation that you can forgive in the context of the rest of the performances as opposed to a signal of where things go from here. Just realised you've got an America flag on your on your jumper, which is good timing. That was intentional. I knew Josh Sargent was going to score. There you go. I didn't say to Adam at any point in that in that game today that he might be drying up. That didn't happen. <laughs> yeah, there you go. You can't always get a goal every 89 minutes. It's um, I think it's better than Erling Haaland as it stands in terms of uh, 
goals per goals per game ratio. Um, and we, we'll, we'll come to Josh Sargent in a minute. But Paddy, I actually felt uh, that Sunderland did probably as good a job as that any team has done at Carrow Road for a, a period in terms of nullifying those threats um, Norwich had. And obviously there's two sides to this. There's lots of injuries from a Norwich perspective. They had a, a lot of injuries as well, Sunderland, and, and probably have a, a longer list. But I felt the way that they, and Mike Dodd spoke a little bit about this after the game, the way they, they sort of tried to control the, the centre of the pitch a, a little bit. They were quite brave and, and left the fullbacks one Norwich's fullbacks one one-on-one at points as well. And I think it was helped by the fact that they looked quite tidy in, in possession. There's a lot of technical players in that side. I probably liked a little bit of a uh, of a of a figurehead um, up front. You know, dare I, as, as is the case with most championship sides, you, you drop Josh Sargent into into their eleven, for example. I think they'd look a very different side. But I felt, and and that probably is is what makes it more impressive in in the context of how Norwich City have won it because the first half was very flat generally, but but Norwich looked like they were just struggling a little bit to to kind of get to grips with how Sunderland had stopped them. I think they'd set up a little bit differently to to what they were expecting, but in the second half there was an improvement, and the fact they were able to solve, I guess, the riddles that Sunderland set for them, that's a, a another major plus kind of in their in their column tonight. Yeah, I mean, watching it first half, I thought it was you know. It was very clear. Grant Holt's just fallen on my head. Uh, there we go. We did predict that might happen. <laughs> yeah. That's better than an errant tweet, mate. That's comedy gold, that. That would be on the outtakes. But uh, we digress again. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, thought they were, I thought they were the better side, first half, if I'm honest. Um, yes, I know there was that sergeant chance that sort of hit their centre. Norwich, back. sorry. No, Norwich. I thought someone were the better side. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Okay. Yeah, no, because uh, they were controlling the game. Mm. Um, albeit, I think there was one shot on target for both teams in that first half and that was a Sunderland effort but um, just the movements the rotations they had across the centre of the park Ekwe was very good I thought and and they had a high line you know they condensed the play and um, and they were very aggressive in their press as well so they did have to decode a few things second half and um, and you could argue that you know it was still very even I think uh, Dodds himself said post-match that it, he thought it was a bit of a basketball type of feel to him watching on the sidelines. You know, they had spells of, I wouldn't say dominance, but where they had felt that you had the, they had the upper hand and likewise Norwich. I mean, they did have one or two decent chances in the second half. Sarah had a great chance. Uh, Science had a, a chance you could have done better with. Um, Barnes had one that came back off the bar and was, was smothered at close range before Sargent's goal. So, but equally, you know, Angus Gunn has made an excellent save, I think not having seen it back but in real time it felt like he pushed that against his own bar um, from bar I think it was and uh, you know there was one or two other slightly panicky moments particularly in that it felt like quite an elongated uh, stoppage time I know it was five minutes but it, because it was quite a tense feel around the place that um, you know the game was a bit too close to Angus Gunn's goal for my liking but uh, yeah I mean like Sam said it wasn't it wasn't a very high quality affair but you know, I, I thought they looked like very much still a work in progress, and, and that's understandable given the managerial changes they've had this season. Um, but you can see they've got something to work with there, and of course, massive miss for them is the boy Clark. I mean, he was he was head and shoulders best player on the park on Weir's side in the reverse game, uh, which they ran out fairly comfortable winners. And um, I think I'm right saying Adam, did, did Dodd say say like 35 percent of their goals uh, yeah. are down to that man? So you take him out of any side in the championship, but this Sunderland side, then they're, they're going to look a little bit lacking maybe in the final third. So, but that's, you know, that's the cards. Norwich have had, had to deal with that, the other side of the equation this season on numerous occasions. So it's gone from today in that respect. And, uh, but yeah, I, I, I would have thought at half time that, that Wagner and his coaching team and those players, the senior ones particularly, would know they needed to pick up the pace because it, it was too comfortable. And it was Sunderland who were, not dictating, but the game was suiting their eye, I felt, more than Norwich. Um, and that's credit to the, the fact that they came out second half and, and got the job done, albeit you know, it wasn't a, a rip-roaring Cardiff or Watford-style game, uh, as we've seen recently at Car Road. But for me, that that's even more pleasing that they can get the job done because that is the charge that's been levelled at them now in the last two away games, Blackburn and QPR, both from winning positions. They've let them slip where you wanted them to game manage those better. Today, they've game managed it perfectly. You know, they've kept the clean sheet. They've got Josh Sargent at the other end of the pitch. And while he's on the pitch, they're always going to have a carrier threat. Um, and one moment from him was enough to get the three points. So, you know, I'm actually probably more encouraged watching that 
that, that they've won it in a in a different way, maybe to just free rolling and, and burying teams under avalanches of goals. You know that they can they can eke them out because there's absolutely no doubt between now and the end of the season on the road more so than maybe at Car Road they're going to have to probably grind out a few wins of that nature. And the fact that they can do it uh, is quite encouraging, I think, because you know to get into the top six it's going to take a little bit more than just kind of uh, you know rolling over teams. You, you're going to have your backs against the wall and. Uh, and, and probably have to to win when you're not at your best, and and today you would say that was the case. So um, yeah, I think uh, I think Wagner particularly will go home tonight and feel that's that's another tick in the box for him. Yeah, I I felt it was um, a more pleasing uh, by more pleasing. I mean, it's probably a more satisfying feeling behind today's win than what they did against. Cardiff because uh, I don't want to be disrespectful, but Cardiff were rubbish really when they came to Carrow Road and, 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 didn't, and didn't. Well, they've, they've picked it up, but I'm basing it on on one game at Carrow Road. At Carrow Road, they were they were as bad as I've seen here um, this season. What Watford is why I didn't feel ne- were necessarily great, but still had some individual quality. That was against I think a, a better team than perhaps the points that, that they've got on the board. Um, and actually, for for large portions of this season, before maybe the chaos ensued after Tony Mowbray, they were very much in that top six hunt. So the fact that Norwich have built an eight point cushion to them as well is is a, is a massive thing. And I guess Adam, we're um, you know it's taken us sixteen minutes, but we're we're back talking about Josh Sargent again, aren't we? Because that had all the makings of a goalless draw, really, that game. And it's 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 one moment. It's a Ben Gibson cross, and then it's three glorious touches by 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 that man. Eleven goals in in what fifteen now? I think it is. It's it's just remarkable what what he's done, and he's he's basically won Norwich City two more points than perhaps they they would have won without him today. Yeah, I mean that's kind of a theme of of what he is. You know, he doesn't even necessarily have to be on his game at all points, but you just know if he gets that one opportunity, that there's nobody else in a Norwich shirt you'd rather that you know opportunity fall to. And as today proven, you know, the sort of ability to to swivel and put it in the back of the net, and it's earned them another crucial three points. And there's been sort of multiple opt- multiple times that that's happened this season. You know, sort of go back to Southampton at home where they weren't great at all. One chance he buries it, and it's kind of. Those moments, and um, that's why so well, he was such a big miss um, in that spell when he was out from the end of August right through to Christmas. Because um, you know, sort of, it's all hypothetical, but you'd love to know where Norwich would be if he would have been available for all those months. Because he, for me, there's probably not any better strikers really in the championship. You know, you look at his goals per minute rate at the moment. Um, he is the complete striker, and David Wagner kind of, I suppose, sort of. I spoke quite quite glowingly about him again in, in his post match and and what he does for this team. Um, yeah, he's, he's a huge player um, and a player that you know we, I think we mentioned on a podcast maybe a few weeks back. You know, a player that definitely will be uh, of Premier League interest this summer. Um, not something you want to think about, but it's um, that's just testament to him and his form at the moment. Um, and long may it continue because uh, there's some really big games ahead, and you know. It, they go to Middlesbrough midweek and, you know, we know what Middlesbrough, you know, under Carrick, I know they've maybe not been in, in great form, but they're still a good side. And it's kind of game that, you know, might be a rainy night in Middlesbrough on a Wednesday. You need that one one chance to go in the back of the net. And, you know, as, as was the case today, um, he's the man you'd hope you'd fall to and you'd back him to score it. Yeah, we had all seasons at Carrow. So there was one moment in the in the second half. We had sunshine in one box and basically a storm in the other, which was, uh, which was quite incredible. But... Um, Josh Sargent's a storm in the box. There's a there's a segue for you, and he and he, and he was this afternoon. Three three glorious touches, Sam. But but that is the quality that he has, and, and dare I say, and Adams kind of articulated it nicely there. Uh, and I'm not I'm not constantly trying to sell Josh Sargent. I don't. Want to, mm-hmm. But they, it, it was a goal befitting a player who increasingly feels like he's above the level that he's playing at at the moment. Well, I'm sure that's something that's that's running through his mind at the moment. He's one of probably a few players at the moment that not only will be desperate to get into the playoffs and get into the Premier League with Norwich, but maybe have that cushion that if it doesn't happen, um, they're likely to have Premier League clubs obviously interested in them. I thought it was, in a way, it was, it reminded me of how we talk about goalkeepers at times in terms of the fact that he didn't really have too many clear-cut opportunities in the box. He wasn't especially good, I actually thought, uh, throughout the 90 minutes. Most of what he did was coming to the halfway line, um, collecting the ball with his back to goal and not really having too many options as Norwich tried to sort of force the ball through through the middle of the pitch. And then to, to pop up with a moment when the ball comes up to you sort of 10, 15 yards out in the 81st minute and to dispatch that chance, um, I think shows a, a readiness that, 
really is important for for strikers, especially if you're going to be successful in the Premier League. And uh, I think that's something he actually struggled with um, when when Norwich were in the top flight. It felt a little bit like whenever he got a chance that there was this panic in his head of, you know, oh, I've got a chance, I've got a chance, I've got to make the most of it. Um, there was a that open goal he had in that 0-0 draw with Brighton. It felt a little bit like that. Um, he was snatching at chances. He wasn't really um, quite concentrated on them, you felt. And then that moment today was, was exactly what Norwich or probably most teams in the bottom half of the Premier League need in that division, really. They need somebody who can absorb 80 minutes of not really having exactly what they want, maybe having to do more of the hard work um, side of the game and, and less of the enjoyable bit in the box and then to still pop up with, with your one big chance and, and score it. So I think that bodes well for for his future career. I'm sure he hopes in the top flight. It does feel that inevitably between now and his his retirement there will be a few seasons in the Premier League, whether that's with, with Norwich or not, and how soon that is remains to be seen. But you'd suggest, based on his, his form this season, that there will be clubs interested in him. And uh, probably the only way that Norwich can be absolutely sure of, of his services next season is to get promoted. Indeed. And it's, it's, uh, you know, we, we spoke a little bit about where the game is at in terms of number nines, Paddy, but I, I think he's, he's really interesting because Sam referenced it there. He came to Norwich in, in the Premier League. He was, it, was, it was too soon for him, really, in terms of that opportunity and, and where, he was, where he was at. The transformation in terms of him and, and, and his game, if you look at that, that kind of um, raw uh, player who, who Norwich City signed from Werder Bremen in, in 2021 to where he is now, where he can go in behind, he can come short, he can score with his head, he can score with his feet, he could... I don't know, school with uh, whatever, um, whatever he he has really. He, he's 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 ruthless. He's lethal, but he's so important. I know there's been a lot of focus on what he does in the press, but he's also increasingly. And Sam referenced it there. To me, it feels like he's becoming increasingly important to the way that Norwich City build up as well. Oh, he's yeah, he's always pivotal, really. And Wagner, you know, when I questioned, well, put the question to him about he's won you another game he wanted to shut that down and move swiftly on to the press that he's the first line of the press with with Barnes and it's his it's his overall impact within that template and and we saw you know the contrast is with each passion game that he scores and and shows what he's all about with that period when he wasn't available and then Barnes alongside uh it's night and day in terms of what this Norwich output is or this outfit is sorry is capable of and uh probably concerning that you know they are so reliant on him uh, as an individual, but then in the last segment we just talked about Clark and Sunderland, and m maybe that's the championship. M may maybe the difference of one or two individuals is even more marked uh, th th than than going into the Premier League. But there's no, I mean, there's a maturity to his game now as well, and a confidence. You know the fact that Timu Puki has moved on; he wasn't really going to get a chance ahead of him in the position of the pitch. He wanted to that object has now been removed, that obstacle. Um, and he's muscled his way in there, and uh, you know it was sort of him, maybe him and Adam Eder. That's how it felt like at the start of the season. Who's going to you know succeed the king, sort of thing? And uh, it's very clearly there's no debate, albeit Adam Eder is banging them in for Celtic, but um, but that's a different discussion point at the moment. But for Josh Sargent at the moment, um, you know you wouldn't would you swap him for any other forward player in the championship? I, I don't think you would, um, and that's a testament to him and. Uh, and how he's he's obviously a very intelligent lad that he's you know he's he's came in as we've discussed here you know he struggled maybe that first season albeit at Premier League level and maybe England more broadly in the English game and, and, and demands on a striker in the English game and what you need to add to your game but he's obviously gone away worked on his game um, realised there was areas that he needed to improve and I think Chris Sutton one of his recent columns spoke about it and he knows you know better than any any in terms of. The strikers' toolkit, and it, and he said, it, you know, the the elements he's added to his game, um, he's just now a far more rounded operator, and uh, at his age, you know, with the right mentality, um, you know, where could he go? And and you fear that he'll probably a little bit like, um, you know, the the sort of the Madison cycle prior prior to that he will outstrip the development of Norwich City, and if that is the case, then it'll be about cashing in. Uh, to the best degree possible, whether that's this summer or summers to come. But um, yeah, there, there's there's nothing that you watch from him now that makes you think this is his ceiling, that he's just a championships grade striker. I think he clearly now um, could go higher, how high and 
how good you can be, be well, that time will tell. But uh, it's just good. It's just good to see because, you know, a lot was made of that recruitment window, wasn't it? Um, you know, Jolis again, we could get into that debate as he scored two more today. But a window that wasn't fit for purpose in terms of equipping that Norwich squad as they went into that Premier League season, um, fine. But, but it, this now tells us clearly it wasn't a bad piece of business. It was just right time, maybe wrong player, wrong wrong cycle. Um, but I don't think anybody disputes now that that, even what they paid for him, they're going to recoup that and more. And, and that will, again, have to be another tick in the recruitment box, albeit it wasn't the ready-made article everybody hoped it would be that would keep Norwich in the Premier League. That, alas, that wasn't to be. But uh, let's hope if we get back there with Josh Sargent. Yeah, indeed. He's. Uh, I spoke to him, I can't remember what the game was, but it was a couple of weeks ago and, and he made the point, Adam, that it's his, his first sort of year as a, a, a number nine. And I, I keep thinking back to pre-season, I think it was, was it, it was Olympiacos they played at Carrow yeah. this year, yeah. wasn't it? And I remember speaking to him after that and just thinking that there was, all, it, it was it's, it's weird to kind of articulate, but his, his shoulders seemed broader, he seemed more confident, he, he kind of spoke a lot better than when he first arrived, where he was quite shy and uh, quite media trained, let's be honest, and, and, he's, and, and I think Paddy's right, there's an element of him that feels like he's kind of grown into himself a little bit more as a, as a personality, and you're seeing that on the pitch now as well. And uh, you know, equally, I remember Ashley Barnes saying at the start of the season that there was a player there who didn't know how good he was and how good he, yeah, how good he could be. He's he's not going to keep up this this rate of score. If he does, then you know he's going to be worth a lot of money come the summer if he's scoring goals every eighty nine minutes. I doubt he'll be able to to maintain that. Um, Nor and and this, I guess, is is part of a wider conversation, maybe even about the the strikers. I know Ashley Barnes has been chipping in. We have got a bigger look at of, of Sydney Van Hooydonk as well. They've obviously lost players in in wide areas as well. As Paddy said, it's so important now that there isn't that this this sort of over reliance on him and people relax because you've got a, a guy there that's going to score the goals. Because as, uh, as as maybe Blackburn proved last week, if he doesn't score, then it it can often mean that it's, it's frustration for Norwich City. So. That formula and that sort of riddle that David Wagner's got to solve now is how to get goals from, from other areas as well as Josh Sargent, which admittedly is probably a not nicer um, conundrum to have than maybe a few that he's had this season. Yeah, I suppose that's kind of where you look at someone like Ashley Barnes and Hoydonk off the bench. Uh, you know, hopefully if he gets more minutes like Hoydonk did today, 30 minutes, you know, that will hopefully help him in terms of his match fitness and his sharpness. And, you know, there's there's lots of games to go, 11 big games to go. And there'll be moments in games where maybe Josh Sargent isn't having his best game. And, you know, you, you need that impact off the bench, almost what Adam Eder was in that spell, um, sort of around the, the Christmas period, some really big goals. And it is about kind of other players, you know, sort of chipping in. But to be fair to, you know, the whole Norwich group this season, there has been goals from all areas, which was kind of probably the issue last season. You know, they didn't really have goals coming from anywhere but Pookie or Sargent, which, you know, kind of then leads to, lead to you know, yourself a little bit. Well, I suppose you don't, you don't score a goal if, if those players aren't on the pitch, where now it feels like they've got goals from all areas. But, um, yeah, he's he's so big for what they're trying to do still uh, moving forwards, and they really can't afford for him to, to get injured um, again because, um, yeah, even when he's not on it, you know, he's one, one, one moment, one game, and particularly if they get into the playoffs, you know, he's such a such a key player, you know, those games are always kind of on a knife edge and it's one moment um, and he's such a, you know, sort of player that if he gets that opportunity in the box, he's going to take it as I sort of referenced before. So, um, yeah, I think his confidence, you can see it in him. Um, he looks sort of, you know, a much more happy player, um, a player that's maybe settled in, in Norwich. Obviously, he's got a, a young family as well and I suppose that's always, you know, sort of a, an extra benefit for a play, you know, they've kind of got that that sort of um, home life element as well, which he's probably got here now as well. And he sort of feels like a popular player amongst the group, but also, you know, the fans absolutely love him, you know, and sort of more serenading again for him today. And, you know, you can imagine for a player who's on the pitch, you know, what sort of that does for your confidence when you've got a crowd fully behind you, you know, where you go back to, to the Premier League sort of spell when he was there and... I'm not saying it was a laughing stop, but you know that miss against Brighton does make it really difficult for you. And you know you've got criticism coming from all areas. Now nah, there isn't really any critics. You know he's he's literally um, you know everything's fully praise uh, on him, and he's kind of the the player that everyone or fans you know um, sort of focus in on. So that definitely helps. And you know let's hope if he does get back to the Premier League, he can go and prove himself again because he, he is a player that's definitely fueled on confidence, which is kind of typical for any striker you know you kind of see that a little bit now with Adam Eder and Celtic I know a different completely different level but you know a player that's playing regularly banging in goals and and his confidence is running through his veins and you know he's sort of reaping the benefits from that so um 
yeah, Josh Sargent can't get too low or too high, really. And as long as he maintains um, the maturity that he has, um, yeah, I think he's going to go far. And um, he'll still chip in with some really big goals this season, even if he has a little dip in, in form. Yeah, abs uh, absolutely, and, and you know he's got he's got Dean Smith fighting his corner in America now and bigging him up. So, so that's uh, that's that's I'm not sure if he needs that or not. But <laughs> but there you go. Um, one I, I don't want to call it a concern, but one element I think there is, and, and you know we, everyone universally would agree that keeping him fit is so important. But equally, I, I do just fear if they lost him because of the type of strikers that they have, it might become a little bit of a struggle. They haven't quite got anyone who I would say is, is and having watched Van Hooydonk for half an hour today, I don't necessarily think he's this either. And I don't think, you know, maybe we, we thought he was, but the player who can kind of stretch teams and get in behind and press in the way that he does, that I think would be a, a little bit of a concern. Um, you know, Van Hooydonk clearly is of a very different profile to, to Adam Eder, who, you know, <laughs> had a lot of flaws at Norwich City, but certainly in terms of his physical and his presence did, uh, did give them that outlet, particularly as we've referenced away from home. Part two of the show, we'll be doing Bring the Heat. We'll be talking about wide options uh, and we'll be asking the question, is there any problem that isn't answered by Liam Gibbs? You're listening, stroke watching to the Pinkin.com Norwich City podcast after another home win, a 1-0 victory over Sunderland this afternoon at Carrow Road. And uh, yeah, a brilliant feeling once again in NR1, which brings us nicely on to Bring the Heat, the segment uh, brought to you by our sponsors, Coleman's of Norwich, who have very kindly uh, sponsored us this season. And you can see an array of brilliant, uh, iconic Norwich City shirts, um, who supplied by by uh, by Billy, who has an unbelievable collection. I think he added to it this week with a, a match worn long sleeve Marcelino Nunez uh, FA Cup Anfield um, shirt, which is uh, which is good. He's I, I've been to see his collection and he's very specific. So every version, if there's a shirt with a different uh, like competition on the sleeve or anything like that, he has to get the version. So, uh, like Norwich had their, their their one last week, didn't they? The rainbow one. I'm sure he'll be he'll be clamouring for one of those. So, thank you, Billy, for for the shirts. Hopefully, I've filled enough time for you all to think of a, a bring the heat winner. Um, Sam, I'm I'm going to start with you. Who gets your nomination for for this week? Uh, Demetrius Yanoulis. Uh There were actually a few times when, and I think it was understandable given how how the in possession play was unfolding, but there were a few times when fans questioned um, maybe how quickly Norwich were moving the ball forward. They were getting frustrated at some um, backwards passes. There was one occasion when you knew this, as you can imagine, as a left back was uh, very very close to the city stand. He definitely heard some of the reaction to his his pass backwards and um, turned around and, and had a little shout at the stand. So um, yeah, I thought that was a bit of a bit of heat, but all okay because they ended up with with the three points. Yeah, we had an episode with uh, Kenny McLean in the second half and, and similar lines as well. Maybe we'll, we'll get into that in a second. Paddy, who brought the heat for you this week, straight today? Well, I'm going to go back to this this errant tweet and uh, it's got to be the backroom stuff and the deep heat on Kenny McLean's oh, back. Good. You know, whether they have, I'm assuming, are, are we going back to like uh, black and white football maybe? They don't even use deep heat, I don't know. Other products are available, I'm sure, but uh, I would imagine there's some sort of inflammation of the back. That will have been treated to get the main man as he has become this season. Oh, Josh Sargent, clearly, but uh, you know, Kenny McLean on the pitch for Norwich is massive. And um, and if anything that was required to get him on the pitch today, fair play. So, um, yeah, I'll go with David Wagner's uh, hat tip to Chris and all the sports science and medical staff. Well done, guys and girls. And the new recovery pools at Colney, which I think uh, played a role as well. Adam, who uh, who's your nomination this week? Uh, I'm just going to go for Ben Gibson. I thought he had a, another game that probably will go under the radar. Very solid. Um, obviously, another a clean sheet for them. Um, well, the defence as, as a unit today, a really big clean sheet, of course, in, in helping them grind out a huge win. But I thought his overall play today, you know, everything that kind of... And to be fair, Sunderland didn't really have kind of a, a big physical striker almost what they you know you look at Blackburn last week and Sam Gallagher it's obviously a completely different task but I thought everything in terms of what was put on his plate today he dealt with you know well and in terms of bringing the ball out from the back which is probably one of his, his better strengths um, was positive so um, yeah I think his form at the moment is is certainly playing a big part in, in Norwich's kind of resurgence almost of sorts um, since kind of the Christmas period and you know, bear, you know, bear in mind what he's had to deal with off the pitch and everything you know I think that's a credit to him and, and his kind of um, professional you know sort of a bit uh, professional nature um, as a player you know he's had to deal with criticism and he's obviously proven those doubters wrong um, and you know whether he's 
you know, certainly a player that probably won't be here next season. But you know, if he can be part of a team that's successful come the end of the season, then um, you know that's a, a great way to go out of you know what's been a sort of difficult you know sort of spell at Norwich. You know, lots of highs, lots of lows. Um, but let's hope he can end it on high. Well, I'm just going to go for Ben Gibson, and now I don't know who to who to go for. So I'll just I'll just back up uh, what what you said and uh, and say here here and uh, cop out at that. But yeah, I thought he was I thought he was very good today actually in, in all aspects in position in possession as well. And um, you know we, we spoke about it. I think it might have been last week's pod, Sam or another. There's a few players who feel like their performances have picked up in in recent weeks, and uh, his and I guess it probably coincides with what you spoke about in terms of everything at home settling down a little bit. And um, yeah, he's. Um, I don't, I don't want to say he's looking like he was in in, in 21 uh, in, in that title winning season, but there's there's definitely more shades of that Ben Gibson than, than perhaps ones that that um, different versions that we've seen subsequently, which is uh, which is good to see. So yeah, Ben Gibson for me, um, and yeah, I, I tried to be a bit more creative and think of a different answer, and literally couldn't think of one. So there we go. Um, Paddy injuries again for for Norwich City. Marcelino Nunez uh, absent today with a, a hip issue. It doesn't sound like it's it's um, going to keep him out long. So I think he'll be back for for Rotherham next week, which very much feels like a Kenny McLean at centre back and uh, and that type of game in terms of uh, lots of the ball. And uh, but we'll see how it transpires. It might be very different. Um, Shane Duffy obviously a little bit of a, a setback there. The big one on El Hernandez um, with, with 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 a broken foot that's that's going to put him out for the for the rest of the season. So we we've kind of spoken you know in recent weeks and David Wagner has spoken at every opportunity about the importance of keeping a squad fit. Suddenly looks a little bit of a light Norwich City squad, doesn't it? It, it, it did today. I, I felt. Um, and I don't know. I, was, I kind of said this in my verdict, but at one stage there's six wingers this season, and, and they've been left to it been left with two now. So it is, and it, I guess it re, reaffirms the challenge that they've got in these eleven games, doesn't it? Even with Nunez and Duffy and uh, etc. All, all expected to be back within this month. Well, hopefully, yeah. I mean, it is it's knife edge in that regard. Um, and we we've seen it graphically illustrated. You know, you lose one of your real key players, i.e. a sergeant, for any length of time. The detrimental effect it has on the season at this stage, at that, I'm afraid, would be terminal um, to, to, in terms of the top six. Uh, to lose any of those front-line operators, the ones who are inked in, um, cannot be done with without front-to-back. Angus Gunn, throw him in there. Uh, McLean, uh, sergeant, clearly, as well. And uh, Whereas in the wide areas, I mean... Yeah, Johnny Rowe, for me, is, is the one, clearly, uh, with his output this season, who is the huge miss. On L, it's a shame for that guy, yeah, because I thought he was rounding into one of those more productive seams of form that he's, he's had in his entire Norwich career, um, chipping in with goals and assists. Um, his impact as well, you know, either coming off the bench or starting games. So, so on a personal level, that that is a blow for the lad, but... You know, if they can get John Rowe back, and it, then it's just about bridging between now and then, and, and science and fashion act in their own way. I thought, you know, put it to David after the game, and he was happy enough with their output. And uh, and for me, it's just a holding pattern now. If 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 they can produce sufficient elements of wing play within the overall context of what Norwich are trying to do with the ball and how they progress it up the pitch, until the point Johnny Rowe is back. Then who knows? I mean, it's shaping up that the season's going into OT in terms of uh, playoff football. Oh, steady, steady. Well, shaping up. Steady. You can take shaping up how you want, but uh, lowercase s. But uh, <laughs> at this stage, but if that is the case, then then John Rowe will be back and hopefully of, of a fitness level that he can play a significant part. But they have to get to that point, and uh, the fear now is, uh, without wanting to talk up any more doom. Um, is that you do lose a science or you do lose a fashion act or, or heaven forbid any of those other players are referenced and then because we've been over this terrain pre-Christmas and it was very hard for Norwich to sustain what they were trying to do uh, you would fear the worst so it, it does feel now it's almost a, every time a player goes down or every time we pitch up at Colney for a, a pre-match that you're going to probably be holding your breath a little bit um, for fear that we get the bulletin that we got last Thursday you know which is to paraphrase David, a, a very bad week for them. So, uh, yeah, hopefully, you know, hopefully that recovery pool and all the other assorted uh, gizmos they have there can uh, can just manage the situation. I mean, every Sunderland, you know, as they proved today, you know, every team at this stage will have key players out or, or injury issues. My own team, Cov, Cov have got some uh, big players out at the minute, and and that's the nature of it when you get to this. 
part of a very gruelling championship season. So just trying to navigate a path through as best as they can now. And um, and it doesn't maybe help in that regard, the fitness and recovery aspect that they've got a midweek trip to Middlesbrough. No, it, it, it doesn't. And I guess... Uh, Sam, uh, you know, we've spoken about pathways a, a lot this season, and uh, obviously that we, we saw today Kenneth Bow on the bench, Finley Welsh on the bench. I think it's the first league game that, that Welsh has been on the bench for. I think there was a maybe Bristol City in the yeah. Cup earlier on the season. He was he was in it as well, uh, and I wanted to to highlight that obviously as being positive and Norwich City bring for young players. And we've had lots of those conversations um, throughout this season, but I, I wanted to kind of reference a, a, another angle to that, which is. The knock-on that those two being in the first, Pedro Lima didn't uh, play for the 21 Ziva, which we can only assume is fitness-related, given he, he wasn't involved uh, in, in Norwich's first-team match day squad. But the knock-on is it had is they were able to play five 17-year-olds in their 21. So, uh, as we say, for the squad filling out, it's, it is going to present, even if it didn't today, for for for, for Welsh and Abo, feels like there there are going to be moments where Norwich City are going to have to call on them, and that. That is in itself, I guess, a positive. And it, it is, as we've spoken about lots of times, it should be a real key pillar of what this football club is about. Yeah, definitely. And I think you saw the importance of that to fans from the reaction to Welsh and Abo not only being announced in the squad, which I think, especially across sort of social media, inspired quite a positive response, but also when they went out to, to warm up, if you like, a, a real-life audience, um, they... They were very warm with them as well, so you can tell that the fans really have the the hunger for that. And as you say, they've they've managed to sort of thin out some of the the fringes of the squad, and that does provide opportunities, as you said, not only in the first team but also the knock on effects for the younger players. And um, yeah, that can only that can only be a good thing. I think if say a Christian Fastnack gets injured today or. You know, and then obviously Liam Gibbs ended up coming on right wing, and as he said, we'll we'll talk about that. But in that situation, you imagine pretty much David Wagner, unless he wants to start chucking fullbacks into into those positions, would have to rely on those those academy players. So um, yeah, I think it's it's definitely a positive. I uh, I did see a couple of people sort of questioning the decisions to let go of of the likes of Shemislav Poeta and things like that, and I understand that. In hindsight, when injuries happen, you do have those sorts of concerns. But um, whatever criticism you have of, of Liam Gibbs and probably especially David Wagner's use of Liam Gibbs, you wonder how much more of an impact the real fringe players that, that Norwich have let go would have had on that game than maybe a, a Finley Welsh or a Ken Abbo could have could have had. So, um, yeah, I think in terms of the first team, they actually haven't lost much Um quality and depth they have lost players to injury and that happens to everyone but I don't think although this probably isn't the most exciting crop of, of under 21s that that Norwich have ever had I still think the better players in that crop are good enough to be competing on the fringes of of the Norwich squad and um, I actually was was listening to a bit with this is a bit of a tangent but I was listening to a bit with uh, Alexis McAllister talking about that sort of clutch of of youngsters Liverpool now have in and around the 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 sort of first team they've got there, and I think when you have a first team that knows there's such a high quality of young player pushing them in the first team, that will only improve their levels. There's there's countless evidence of how much players improve when they've got better players behind them. So um, yeah, I think the more that Norwich can get those players involved, especially the better players in that group, the better it is for, for everyone. So uh, yeah, good for the fans, probably good for the perception of, of David Wagner as well. And um, given what Ben Napper said when, when obviously he spoke to the media, what, what would it be about a month ago now? Um, it's clearly a, a priority of his as well. So yeah, good news for everyone. I, I think there's an element and I understand, you know, the, the whole stuff about oh, you know why do you let Poeta go if yeah. you if you then shorten options but I think you have to look a bit you have to look at it a bit bigger than that yeah. in terms of uh, you know uh, we sit here now Norwich might finish in the playoffs they might not e either way is you know a young player in that position is, is going to be way more beneficial to them than than Shema, sort of with the greatest respect to him yeah. than than he is in, in in the long term and developing that and in terms of value that that maybe they're able to to, to get from those types and the experience that they would have they would have had from today alone. I think is makes it a worthwhile ep um, exercise, and obviously they'll be they'll be training regularly as well. Adam, is is there a fear because you said Norwich have gone from having really four good senior wide options, Rowe, Hernandez, Fashnacht, Science, to having two, and and you've got 
players there, uh, re use this reference on, on the team news video that we did. You've got one in Fashnacht who feels like he's probably scored more goals than his performances have warranted. And Sainz, who maybe hasn't quite scored as many as perhaps some of his moments within games um, have warranted as well. I, I think both are probably on the periphery a little bit too often for my liking. There's different reasons for that Sainz. Well, both their first season in, in English football, but um, there's just a little bit of an inconsistency, I think, that, that we're seeing with Borja Sainz. But when he does produce, he produces. Um, is that is that the fear as well? Because we've spoken about Sargent and, and over reliance on him. There'll be people now looking to the bench, looking to the squad, and, and maybe feeling there aren't quite enough options to, to change it. And not just in terms of of personnel, but in terms of profile of of player as well. Yeah, I think you kind of look at the wide options. And I mean, Fasnak and Signs are very different players. Um, I just feel Fasnak's probably be more more of a benefit to Norwich off the bench this season. You know, sort of he comes alive in the box. Almost, he's not really kind of natural wide man. He's uh, He's not really someone who takes on on men, and you know he's sort of um, he doesn't always look comfortable out wide. I think he looks better when he's in the box. Um, but I mean, obviously, you know he's going to have to to start games now, and um, it's going to be about fitness, you know. And obviously, they can't afford for any of these players to, to dip in terms of fitness or performances because you know they are now effectively in the the key sort of run of the season, and the every game now is is massive in terms of what the outcome of the season is going to be. So. Yeah, I think I think there has got to be a concern in terms of the the general sort of perception of the squad now in terms of the wide options and and what they've got. Um, I felt like Hernandez for the system and what they're trying to do is is a more suitable player um, in the same way Rowe is in terms of bring them up the pitch, the the pace they've got, um, and probably the end product in terms of when it comes to to the sort of uh, the point where you need the cross to be delivered. Um, I think they're probably. Got it slightly more in the locker than Fashion Act, but you know, I mean, the option as you, as you mentioned, it, it opens up the pathway to, to younger players, and who knows at the end of the season if um, Norwich already tied up in the top six, and you get to the last game of the season, you know, you often see these kind of opportunities for young players arise, and um, yeah, I think you know someone like Welsh will if he gets an opportunity off the bench this season, that's you know a signal to, to Norwich fans that there's going to be young players trying to you know build themselves into the team next season, irrespective of what division or where the rest of the season goes. Um, you know, as you know, as you mentioned, Blahetta, You know, let's be honest, he hasn't really delivered anything this season. So, um, to me, it's no real loss. And actually, um, I'd be personally more excited um, seeing younger players coming off the bench, and they almost have that little bit more freedom in that they're a young player, and there's not really any kind of pressure on them. Um, and sometimes they thrive under that. You know, you kind of look at. I sort of go back to when Max Aarons was thrown in at Portman Road. He just looked like a player that you know would effectively had no pressure on him and he performed you know and obviously kicked on from there so um yeah i think there's there's pros and cons to it and uh you know obviously norwich have to look at it from from a different perspective as well in terms of the financials and, and the wages and all that that comes into it and obviously you know uh, so getting sort of certain players like that off the books was was crucial to what they're trying to do so yeah let's hope that you know fr from a science and fashion act perspective um they can sort of keep well try and reach the levels that we've seen at certain points of the season more consistently. But obviously, you know, it's going to be difficult when you're having to go three times in a week and you've not really got players there to, to come off the bench other than, uh, of course, Liam Gibbs. And you've, you've stolen my, my thunder there. Apart from the, uh, <laughs> the the defensive midfield debate, Paddy, is there is there anything that Liam Gibbs can't do on a, on a, on a football pitch? Because he, he feels like he's becoming like... Jakob Soren, the the attacking equivalent of of Jakob Soren. I don't know if he has played as a winger at any point during his uh, during his life, but he's um, he'd do a good job as polyfiller, wouldn't he, in terms of uh, of what he's becoming. But in seriousness, I mean, what, what do you make of how he's been used this season? Because he he won Norwich City's Young Player of the Year last year. He was handed a a long term contract, five year contract off the off the back of that. He was given a uh, a senior squad number from what was it forty six last year to to, to eight this year. Um, it does feel, I don't want to say mismanaged because that feels really dramatic, but it, it does feel like as you look at the year and his development has, has significantly stalled. Well, purely on a on a how many minutes, how many appearances, how many starts comparative between this season and that one you referenced, yeah, then it has stalled. And um, you know, so you then have to drill down. Is it the player? Is it the, the head coach? Is it... A combination of both and that's probably where this lies and when we put it to David very recently it was kind of I've, I've sat down we've had chats you know he he feels David feels that maybe his performance levels have dipped a little bit he talked about in training more so than in games um, but is that chicken and egg because you know he's not he's not playing you know he's the fact that he's not getting the game time exposure it, it, 
And not in a single position either. No, he's, he's playing well, all yeah. over the place. Yeah, I mean, without, you know, it, Liam Gibbs being sat here and, and candidly walking us through how he feels this season's played out and, and the fact, factors, to. yeah, anytime he wants, yeah, we've got a spare sofa over there. Exactly. Get rid of us clowns and he can come <laughs> and raise the quality level. But uh, it, the reality is, this season is is now you know reaching its conclusion and it'll play out how it plays out. But in terms of when they come back in pre season and whether that's this head coach, a different head coach, um, whatever else in terms of the squad change around, Liam Gibbs is clearly a part of the future of this football club. Contractually, you know, I know it was a different sporting director, but there's no doubt that they they do rate him as an asset that they've, they've brought through um, later on slightly in his academy journey. We know his backstory and the Ipswich connection. Um, so now they then have to sit down and, and work it out with the player himself. What is he? What type of player is he? What positionally is he? Where can he add the greatest value to this team moving forward? Um, and not a reset, but uh, but certainly uh, you know an acceptance that that tough second season syndrome is behind you now and, and then you need to kick on again. And that's a challenge for him as well, but also the people around him, like the, as I say, the coaching staff, that they need to extract the ability that we saw in that debut season where he looked to play her. I mean, I, I'm not too fixated on what is his best position. He's just a very, in my opinion, a, a player of some promise who needs to be given the environment and the platform to go and express that promise. And, and if it isn't going to be here, then, you know, it was no secret if if they maybe had done the deal for Varane in January, he would have gone out on loan in the closing days of that window. So there was there was already a thought process that it maybe has reached a point with him, as it has done with some of the other younger lads who are out on loan, that he needs to go and, and play regular football. And if that's not going to be in Norwich's first team, then it needs to be elsewhere. So because you don't want, and he's always used as the as the example, you don't want an Adam Eder situation where he's burst on the scene. You think he's perpetually knocking on the door but he never quite and then the seasons just tick off and then he's in his early 20s and you know he's got a handful of games comparative to a Max Aarons for example at Norwich so I'm sure they're well aware of that and um, you know this season is as I say re reaching a conclusion and I don't see the trends radically altering now I don't suddenly see Liam get unless we get a, a horrendous situation in terms of injuries in the centre of the park I don't see Liam Gibbs suddenly forcing his way back in to be a frontline option for the rest of this season. So that will have to be unpicked and put back together again in the summer because it, it can't be in the players' interest and it's not in Norwich's interest to have another season like this for Liam Gibbs. Well, I was, uh, the, the thing I find uh, a little bit strange is, so Nunez has, has, has been missing or missed today with a, a hip injury. Gabriel Sarra has been playing more advanced. Why isn't Liam Gibbs in that conversation to fill in the role that, that, that Nunez did? It's, in my head, a lot better to have him dropping into a back three or taking a ball in those deeper positions than it is a player of Gabriel Sarra's quality, when, particularly in, at home games, where you can get him further up the pitch and unlock defences in, in, in the way that we, we know he does and, and, and the way he did at Ewood Park to, to tee up uh, Josh Sargent. That was a wonderful pass that will get lost in all everything, but a lovely pass, a ridiculous pass to set Borja Sainz away um, on, on the left, I think, just in the closing stages of the first half so it's not even necessarily about him and I think the frustration for me is not really heard David Wagner reference him as a, and maybe I'm wrong but I haven't heard him reference him as a central option and um, that I think will, will be a little bit frustrating because like you say what what is he where does he play when Norwich signing from Ipswich they spent a lot of time in their academy because he had played as a 10 at Ipswich he was more advanced um, in, in their academy they signed him and basically spent a long period of time teaching him this kind of six to eight position um, that he then played under in, uh, in Dean Smith's tenure and actually probably produced his best football under Dean Smith. Um, and since then, he's just, yeah, he's, he's, as you say, it's drifting. He's playing as a second striker, which he isn't. He, I don't think he's a, a wide player. He, he is, for me, a, a central player. That's where his, um, where his best football has come. So, yeah, as you say, what one to watch it, but... I think from his perspective and you kind of mapped it out there the fact that they were willing to go and sign Jonathan Varane and send him out on loan that doesn't necessarily I don't know it doesn't ring particularly well for him I think in terms of uh, certainly his, his his short to mid long f uh, future here long term maybe slightly different but um, but yeah there we go um, Sam trip to, to Middlesbrough this, uh, this, this week which is always welcome particularly in in midweek, so thanks to thanks to the fixture computer for that. It's much appreciated. Um, it's going to be going to be difficult, isn't it? It, it? 
it's one of one of those championship stereo uh, typical games that you look at. You look at them, it's going to be tough. Um, but, but particularly given Norwich City's away form, it would be a real statement of intent. I think if they could go to Middlesbrough and produce a result like they have done today. Yeah, it was one of those actually where um, me and Adam were talking about it a little bit on the the preview show for this game. It feels like Wagner's been saying, you know, that it's a good point on the road against Blackburn, against QPR. I actually think that logic applies more to this game. I think when you go to those teams that are struggling in the bottom half of the table, it's on a weekend, they haven't had that short lead up to the game that obviously they will take to, to Middlesbrough. I felt that was or those were the opportunities to to go and get three points on the road. And now they get to a position where if they had won those games, they could probably go into this one feeling fairly secure that a a draw would be a good result. Um, But they obviously didn't manage to do that. And with the proximity of all of their playoff rivals, um, it feels still like they have to go there and win, which, as you said, will be a a very difficult task. They've been a, a little bit up and down this season. It feels like they're... Peaks have been high and their troughs have been quite low. Of course, it's not the same side that that beat Norwich um, five one last season or that sort of pushed for promotion and got into the playoffs. So, um, yeah, I think it will be a, a tough task. It's probably an easier one than than what they had last season. But still, when you travel that far and it's only been a couple of days rest um, and and the pressure is on to get a result while you're in that playoff mix. Um, yeah, I think three points would be absolutely massive, probably even bigger than than this huge three points um, today. So if they could get that going into another home game against the league's bottom side, I think the confidence would be higher than it ever has before. But yeah, as you said, it will be it will be a very difficult task, and I think it would be a huge one if they if they could. What what for you, Adam? Marks a successful week for for Norwich City. It's four. It's a win today. Essentially, do you feel that's taken enough pressure on them to to go to to, to Middlesbrough in the week? And I don't I don't want to say they're going to set up or play for a draw by any means, but where it feels like a draw wouldn't be the worst result in the world, providing obviously then they could they could beat Rotherham because that would be uh, my maths six uh, seven points across the 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 week. That would I'd be shocked if they got that. And, didn't finish the week in the top six. To be honest, it would mean that Hull have done tremendously well. And if that's the case, then you know you 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 raise your hat and you say fair play to them. Yeah, I mean, me and Sam, as, as you reference, were kind of talking about the week uh, ahead on the preview show yesterday, and I think we both kind of concluded that six is the absolute bare minimum. Seven is a is a good return. Obviously, nine is an unbelievable return, and that would pretty much probably well, not guarantee, but you'd feel that would definitely guarantee they'd get in the top six. So. Um, I think a point at Borough would be acceptable, but then obviously you then look at kind of the the road ahead and it's like they've got a couple of more winnable games again after Rotherham. You know, I think they go to Stoke, who are sort of struggling. I know they got the win today, but um, against Middlesbrough actually, but, um, you know, they're not in the greatest of form. They've got Plymouth at home, who a different side, I think, away from home than they are at home. And it, you just feel like it then starts to put more pressure on a win. Midweek at Middlesbrough would be a big statement again um, of this side and its credentials and, it almost feels, I think, a little bit kind of that uh, would have been eighteen ninety when they went to Borough and Ono Hernandez got the winner. You know, it's different circumstances, but that felt like a really difficult game, and that was a, a sort of a win that just again kicked on the momentum. Um, and obviously, they went on to to win the title that that season. But um, it's never an easy place to go, particularly midweek. Um, but you know, again, it's, for me, it's how they go and approach the game. If they get the an early goal, it unsettles already probably a, a borough crowd that's maybe not, you know, fully happy with everything that's going on at the moment. Um, and then it's just about trying to kill the game off and get three points. But yeah, I think if you said to me seven points at the end of this week, I'd be pretty content with that. And I think probably David Wagner and most of the players would be. Yeah, and uh, because of I don't I don't want to get into it really, but because of accreditation, uh, interesting accreditation allocations at, at Middlesbrough, uh, Sam and Adam are going to be in the way end. So if you see them, be nice first and foremost. I'm sure you will be, uh, and then you know go and speak to them because I'm sure they'll be they'll be doing lots of uh, fan reactions and, and speaking to fans uh, on Wednesday night. So if you're there and you bump into into these two fellas, then um, yeah, stop them for a chat. That would uh, that would be good. Uh, finally, Paddy, very quickly, some interested spectators at Carrow today. Mark Atanasio, who's, who's been overshadowed a little bit on his uh, on his on his return to England the the by uh, uh, by Labour leader Keir Starmer, who I'm sure a bit of satire for you. I'm sure he'd have enjoyed the battle of the centre ground at, uh, at Carrow Road this afternoon. Um, 
Mark Atanasio, I think I'm, I think we've worked out that's the first time he's seen Norwich City win in, in, in the flesh, which is uh, which is quite something. But interesting that, that he was at Carrow Road uh, today. Can you tell us a little bit more about why he was at Carrow Road today and, and that sort of thing? Because I'm sure there'll be a lot of two and adding two and two and making five as as to his as to his presence in England and in Carrow Road as, as well. Well, as far as we're aware, Connor, there was a business of football summit ft sponsored event two-day conference you might Some big names at that, i was going to say you might have seen on on x uh, as it is now you know like says latan ibrahimovic was there and gazidis former arsenal chief exec i think the ac milan uh jerry cardinal is it who's part of that redbird consortium who i think atanasio knows through the the, the baseball circuit as well and one or two other you know quite large hitters in the game just talking about a some of the key topics, you know, at the top end of f football, obviously the, the power dynamics with UEFA and the Champions League, revenue, uh, the women's game, that was under the microscope and how you grow that. So, yeah, some movers and shakers. I think Zoe Weber was at last year's annual event. I think Delia herself has appeared at it a few years ago. And um, from what we're led to believe, he was a part of a panel discussion about... Uh, rather interestingly, how you build a football club to make revenue from it. So, uh, long way that continue if if, uh, if he's looking at Norwich, uh, because if he's done that, then he'll, he'll obviously have turned it around in quite a big way. Um, what's that saying? You know, in football ownership, if you want to make a fortune, you start with a larger one or something like that. It's some saying like that, if you want to be a, make a profit in football. And uh, so that was, I think, essentially, uh, would be one of the main reasons he was over for a, a very short trip he's obviously got a business interest he's got a london base as well part of his uh his uh, you know financial empire as it were so why wouldn't you take in uh, a game at the Cara in the in the hail and the rain, rain and the wind i noticed uh, some of the pictures pc uh took uh, he had a nice green and yellow uh, fetching uh blanket so i'm sure he, he was kept very warm in a director's box i wish i'd had one of those to be fair <laughs> Got your heated gear. I've joined you in that. Yeah, yeah, yeah you have copied me, Connor. It's not the first time, but there you go. And uh, so, other than that, I mean, we can't really offer any more insight. I mean, the, the the point of reference is is as we all know, without getting into the the weeds of it, but the, the share allotment process from earlier in the year, and um, which once clearing all the relative regulatory hurdles, will effectively mean him and his grouping uh, uh, on a share footing with Delia and Michael uh, moving forward and then that lockstep arrangement that they've got we, we all know the ins and outs of that as far as we're aware I had a check um, last week I think it was and that's still um, still with the Football League um, but by all accounts and, and again his presence there today would underline he's in it for the long haul and internally I think it's very clear that they're working to the process that that's effectively already in place and that, that that he is and it was mapped out quite clearly in the last set of published accounts and thereafter the share allotment process he is now the kingmaker him and his group financially um you know the, the life support uh, without being too too uh sort of prosaic about it but moving forward he is an intrinsic part of what this club are, are looking to do and uh as a result you know it was good that he was there today in, in, in terms of you know, seeing him in the director's box with his wife and uh, I'm sure he enjoyed the end result, if not sitting in the cold, because I'm sure it's a lot warmer where he's based on the uh, the, the West Coast of the US. But uh, yeah, and, and uh, as I say, hopefully, you know, the actual um, public rubber stamping of that will come in due course. And again, that all flows into what feels like, particularly if they don't manage to get over the line and get back to the Premier League this summer, a big summer ahead on and off the park for Norwich City. And if you had that clarity publicly about him and his status and his group status, I think that would um, that would set the parameters for what this summer might look like. Do you think Keir Starmer spent as much in the club shop as Liz Trusted? <laughs> <laughs> very, very unlikely. Very unlikely, yeah. I noticed Ed Balls was there alongside yeah. him, so uh, I'm sure that's where the connection was. Didn't you say he was an Arsenal fan? Star yeah. Wars, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, Got to watch some proper football oh, yeah, today, indeed, proper indeed. championship football. So yeah. there we go. That uh, that seems like an app. Oh, uh, I'm, 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 I'm just, just going to add that, because uh, it's just popped in my head, we are uh, recording this at, at uh, NQ head, headquarters, yep. uh, where Rachel Reeves, the shadow chancellor, was... 
as I point over just over there, about 30 yards away on Thursday. So I had a bit of a shock when I was in down this part of the office. And, uh, was she asking you about Norwich's She didn't come over. No, 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 no. She clearly, you know, I don't know. She's a lead. She's not a listener. She's a Leeds MP. I checked. I checked. Right. So I, I was I was primed if she came over. I was going to ask her about Leeds and, uh, you know, but... Uh, Daniel Farker. Yeah, no, I mean, I could tell you a story when I sat on a table with Theresa May once, which is purely down to my wife's political uh, journalistic qualifications. And, uh, and she... I've been trapped in here with Boris Johnson before. So yeah, that's, that's what I mean. Yeah, but no, but the, the, the anecdote there was that she had absolutely no interest in football whatsoever and glazed over when She's she crazy. when she asked me what I did for a living. Well, uh, re I'd say that. She then recounted that she was a Merton councillor. I don't know why we've gone off on this tangent. Uh, when Wimbledon won the FA Cup in 88, yeah. but that was her only. So whether Rachel Reeves is um, going to be coming to a director's box anytime soon, I don't know. But uh, she was here and then Keir Starmer was not many... Not many miles down the road from here, so um, this is where it's all happening. The, the east is where it's going to be, maybe for the for Labour in terms of uh, the looming election. So uh, you never know. We'll get Liam Gibbs, we'll get Keir Starmer, we'll get Rachel <laughs> Reeves on here, and we can go home. <laughs> Happy days. They're, they're all they're all welcome. Thank you very much for for, for listening and, uh, and watching, particularly the last five minutes, which have gone down a bit more of a political rabbit hole than I was expecting. But there we go. Um, another Norwich City win, and uh, the the playoff march continues. We'll see you next week after hopefully another home win against Rotherham United. Thanks for watching. See you soon. <laughs>